The human demand for fish as food has been the major reason for the devastation of the oceans. And part of that demand comes from the belief that fish eating is essential for good health. This is not correct. In fact, in our polluted world, eating fish has become a well-established health hazard. Are we meant to eat fish? When consumers have a choice between beef and chicken or fish, what do they choose? Considering fish's relative unpopularity, I would say most people don't like the taste of fish. The word fishy connotes a message of a quite unpleasant smelling sulfurous aroma that resembles fresh fish. The taste of the flesh of a fish depends to a large extent upon that fish's diet. Many of the most popular fish, tuna, swordfish, salmon, and rockfish, are carnivores, feeding off small, unpleasant tasting sea animals like anchovies, herring, and squid. But people have the ability to adapt their taste buds and learn to like almost anything, even the odor of sulfur. Rotten eggs and spoiled fish are malodors because of the hydrogen sulfide gas that is released by bacterial actions. Foul body odors are primarily the result of sulfur compounds. The origin of this sulfur is our diet in the form of sulfur containing amino acids like methionine. The sulfur content of fish is particularly high, for example salmon has 12 times more methionine than do sweet potatoes. Seasonings make fish and seafood eating more tolerable. Most people swallow these sea animals only after they are blackened on a barbecue or smothered in a rich sauce. Why are so many health conscientious people promoting fish? Consumers are taught Fish are their only reliable sources of essential omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. They believe that by avoiding fish, they would suffer serious malnutrition. Most health organizations worldwide, including the American Heart Association, the American Medical Association, the American Diabetic Association, and the National Health and Medical Research Council, to name a few, also recommend that people eat fish, primarily for the omega-3 fats. These same groups also warn of the hazards of methylmercury and other environmental contaminants in fish. Recommendations to eat fish are based on laboratory research, but originate primarily from observations of various populations of people worldwide. For example, the rate of heart disease among fish-eating populations, such as the Japanese, is very low, and this has been attributed to the so-called good fats they receive from eating fish. Researchers overlook the marked differences between overall Western and Japanese diets. The primary ingredient in the Japanese diet is rice, and this is the reason they enjoy better health, are trimmer, and more active. The small amount of fish eaten daily is incidental. Good fats are from plants. Only plants can make the omega-3 fats. Fish don't, nor do cows or people. Alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, is made by plants and converted into DHA by infants and adults in sufficient amounts to supply all of our needs including those for brain function and development. After all, the African elephant with a brain volume of 3,000 to 4,000 cubic centimeters compared to the human brain of 1,400 cubic centimeters has no trouble making all the essential fats its brain and the rest of its huge body needs from plant foods. You can safely assume a comparatively puny human can do the same. Do you ever notice that fish can have a metallic taste? Both wild and farmed fish live in increasingly polluted water. The most prominent toxins are polychlorinated biphenyls and mercury. 
PCBs are synthetic chemicals that were once used in electrical equipment. They were banned in the U.S. in the 70s for use in all but completely enclosed areas. But heavy past usage has resulted in environmental contamination worldwide, especially in fish. PCBs are dangerous because they act like hormones wreaking havoc on the nervous system and contributing to a variety of illnesses including cancer, infertility, and other sexual problems. Mercury is a natural element found in the earth. It is released as industrial pollution during various manufacturing processes. Much of this metallic substance accumulates in rivers, streams, and oceans and is converted in the environment into a highly toxic form called methylmercury. In this organic form, mercury becomes concentrated in the food chain by processes referred to as bioaccumulation. Fish, especially those predatory species high on the food chain like freshwater pike, walleye and bass, and saltwater tuna, swordfish, and mackerel, become heavily contaminated with mercury the longer a fish lives, the more the mercury accumulates. The consumption of mercury contaminated fish is the main exposure for people. Almost all of the mercury consumed is efficiently absorbed by the intestinal tract. Since our bodies have no way of excreting this toxin, mercury continues to accumulate throughout life, exerting its detrimental effects. Serious health risks include damage to the nervous system, heart, kidneys, and immune system, particularly for young children and the developing fetus. The results of mercury poisoning for the brain are motor dysfunction, memory loss, and learning disabilities, as well as depression-like behavior. Eating just a single serving of fish each week during pregnancy can lead to more mercury in an infant's body than injecting them directly with about a dozen mercury-containing vaccines. Even if clean fish were available, fish eating would still not be heart healthy. There are many qualities of fish which encourage heart disease. Fish are high in cholesterol which elevates blood cholesterol. Even small doses of fish oils have been shown to raise the bad LDL cholesterol. Fish is also loaded with sulfur containing amino acids like methionine which raise homocysteine levels in the body. Homocysteine is a well-accepted risk factor for heart disease and feeding people methionine will cause dysfunction of their arteries which may promote blood vessel disease. Even fish oil alone can increase homocysteine levels. Here are some other adverse consequences from consuming fish. Fish contain highly acidic animal proteins that accelerate calcium loss, contributing to osteoporosis and kidney stones. Fish don't contain any dietary fiber or digestible carbohydrates, thus having a negative impact on bowel function and physical endurance. Fatty fish, for example salmon, is half fat and loaded with calories adding to one's risk for developing obesity and type 2 diabetes. Omega-3 fats inhibit the action of insulin, thereby increasing blood sugar levels and aggravating diabetes. Fish eating prolongs gestation, increasing birth weight, and the possibility of birth injury and increased mortality. Americans consumed about 4.8 billion pounds of seafood in 2009, most of which was shipped in from other countries after being caught in the ocean or raised in an aqua farm. That same year, about 143 million tons of seafood was consumed globally. In some parts of the world, primarily coastal areas and developing countries, fish is a staple food served as a primary source of protein and nutrients for families. For most of us, fish is a luxury that we're over-consuming, even though we have ample access to other, more sustainable options. As commercial fishing practices work to keep up with the demands, we're not only depleting ocean supplies at a rapid pace, 
but making fish less available for those who truly depend on it for survival. It's a problem that will only get worse, especially as demands increase to feed a global population that's expected to reach 9.7 billion by 2050. But the issue of overfishing goes beyond the meal on someone's plate. The methods by which seafood is captured from the ocean is harming marine species that are already vulnerable and facing extinction. Sadly, commercial fishing operations use methods like trawling, gill nets, and long lines that end up catching more than their targeted species, including sharks, dolphins, whales, sea turtles, and fish. This bycatch which often includes injured marine animals, is then discarded back into the water, causing suffering and putting further strain on species that are already struggling to survive as a result of pollution and the effects of climate change. In 2014, 300 whales and almost 700 sea turtles were entangled or killed in a single year in Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico longlines. And while bycatch isn't always accurately reported by fisheries, it is estimated that up to 40% of overall catch globally is bycatch, and that some fisheries catch more bycatch than their intended catch, with a 66% discard rate in some cases. In addition to the lines and nets injuring marine life, trawling and other methods damage coral reefs and seagrass, both of which provide a home and food source for marine species. Discarded nets, traps, and fishing lines also remain in the water and wash up along shorelines, trapping animals when they become entangled or breaking into smaller pieces that are then unintentionally ingested by fish, birds, and sea mammals. High demand for seafood has been depleting populations at a rate faster than they can replenish themselves, driving some species towards extinction. In fact, 85% of the world's fisheries are either fully exploited or overfished. Their Living Blue Planet report found that populations of utilized fish species have reduced by 50% since the 1970s, with exploitation being the primary cause in most cases. Overfishing harms other marine life by disrupting the food chain, placing animals that rely on that species as a food in danger of starvation. And when populations of predatory species are diminished, other species will overpopulate, destroying biodiversity and causing the entire ecosystem to suffer. Imagine you are walking down a country road lined with apple trees. Hungry from the walk, you reach up to grab a piece of fruit. Suddenly, your hand becomes impaled with a large metal hook that pulls you out of the air and into an atmosphere in which you cannot breathe. We drown fish and other aquatic animals in our atmosphere the same way we drown in theirs. In many places, fish are considered nothing more than food. People here see them as sport, something to go do on a nice sunny day. They spend all day catching and killing these animals and then go home to consume endless amounts of them. So, what exactly is pain? The International Association for the Study of Pain defines pain as an unpleasant and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. The main argument about fish being unable to feel pain originated from a study published by James Rose titled The Neurobehavioral Nature of Fishes and the Question of Awareness and Pain. His study states that all fish lack a neocortex, a part of the brain in humans that is widely associated with awareness and consciousness. Because of these, he states, fish cannot feel pain. However, there are a large amount of studies that took place after roses that completely exposed the holes in his research. A report published by Dr. Stephanie Yu directly argues that Rose's theory is based on the assertion that the neocortex is the sole means by which pain can be experienced, and it suggests that it is the seat of consciousness. It is widely known throughout the scientific community that this is false. 
The complexity of consciousness, like that of pain, is a phenomenon that cannot be restricted to one area of the brain. Pain is an evolutionary adaptation that helps individuals survive. A trait like pain perceptions is not likely to suddenly disappear from one particular taxonomic class. If Rose's assertions are indeed true, it would rule out any other species that lack a neocortex, including birds and amphibians. In another study conducted by Victoria Braithwaite, fish were injected with chemical irritants such as vinegar. The group of fish injected with vinegar displayed behaviors of rapid increase of breath and heart rate and rubbing irritated areas on the side of the tank. The control group of fish that were injected with saline did not display these behaviors. They conducted a similar test on larger fish. The same behaviors were displayed. The vinegar injected was impairing the fish's attention. Fish actually do express themselves and communicate. It is only on a frequency that is completely inaudible to humans without special technology. The anatomy and physiology of a fish is completely different from that of any other species. So how is it right for us to make assumptions on their perceptions, instead of simply trying to understand them from an evolutionary standpoint? Dr. Cullum Brown, who reviewed nearly 200 research papers on fish's cognitive abilities and sensory perceptions, believes that the stress that fish experience when they're pulled from the water into an environment in which they cannot breathe may even exceed that of a human drowning. Unlike drowning in humans, where we die in about 4-5 to five minutes because we can't extract any oxygen from water, fish can go on for much longer. It's a prolonged, slow death most of the time. It would be impossible for fish to survive, as the cognitively and behaviorally complex animals they are, without a capacity to feel pain. And the potential amount of cruelty that we humans inflict on fish is mind-boggling.